welcome to another edition of Roland Rambles. Today's topic is automatic updates. More specifically, it's anything that involves changing the way that an existing system works. If you want the short summary of this video that basically makes it so you don't have to watch it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I want to talk about how automatic updates sucks. In Windows 10, Microsoft began forcing people to get automatic updates to Microsoft Windows. This is carried on to Windows 11. The only way that you can opt out of it is through group policy settings inside Windows 10 or 11 Pro. You cannot do it with Home. I don't know about other editions, they don't exist to me. I do not care. I do not care about your European or your N edition or your education or enterprise. Home and Pro is all I care about. So for the purposes of this video, Home and Pro are all that exist. Pro lets you turn off automatic updates using group policy. However, there are a bunch of things under the hood that continue to run periodically that will check the update system. Uh, if you disable the Windows Update service, it will turn it back on without asking you, without permission. Um, <clears throat> they have this thing called the WAS Medic, W-A-A-S, which stands for Windows as a Service. If you don't know what that means, you need to know what SaaS, Software as a Service, is. Software as a Service is basically rental software or some kind of, uh, usually it's, it's actually used to refer to server-side software that you pay to essentially rent. So if you have a database for your computer repair shop, if you have some sort of work order system or whatever for your computer repair shop and you pay a monthly fee for access to this system, then you are paying for software as a service. However, Microsoft have made no, uh, no effort to hide the fact that they would like for Windows to be a subscription. In fact, one of the ways that things are going now is Microsoft would like to, you, to get you to consider to even start having your computer itself as a subscription. This is insane, but let's wind back a little bit and return to automatic updates and discuss why they're bad, why you shouldn't do them, and what kind of harm they can bring uh, relative to what they claim that they do for you. An automatic update to Windows typically will change a large number of system files that make up Windows. These are, well, to put it the way every single phone app ever likes to put it in the uh, change logs, like what's new in, the, in this version? Why should I update it from version X to version Y? Uh, bug fixes and performance improvements. <clears throat> but Microsoft's even worse. They will label it a security update and then they will not tell you anything about it. They'll just say, this update improves the reliability of Windows. And no real information. You have to go digging to find out exactly what it is that they're willing to tell you it handles. And if you dig and you get the details, or at least the details that they'll give you, you often find that this fixes some security vulnerability in some library somewhere or some piece of code, whatever, that if someone already has administrator rights to the machine, they can get more than administrator rights to the machine if they do a, a sequence of very specific things. And it is true that these um, absurd vulnerabilities where it's like, oh, you, you know, they have physical access or they have administrator access or they're already logged in as a user and, you know, and it lets you do this other thing that isn't really much of an escalation. It is true that certain security breaches um, these days have to chain 
little vulnerabilities together to add up to one large one. Um, that th This is a theoretical possibility. Now, let's assume for the moment that you are a person, you're just a regular person, I'm gonna brighten this up. You're a regular person, you don't have, you know, millions of dollars in the bank, you don't have a database of 100,000 user accounts, you don't have a pile of personal information, you don't have um, you don't have a bunch of like credit cards stored, none of that. You're just some guy. Some guy sitting in his car, talking to a camera, making a stupid vlog or something, and you just you store a bunch of stuff on your computer, maybe you do online banking, whatever, but you're not a big corporation. You're not some entity that has a large target of some sort that it's, it, if it's hard to breach, it's worth it because if they can get into it, they get all kinds of personal information that they can use to steal identities, commit credit card fraud, pull scams, and so on. <clears throat> let's, let's just assume that you're just a normal person. Is any of this ever going to happen to you? No. No, it is not. We are so far past the days when if you simply clicked on an email in Outlook Express and it loaded the preview pane for that email, it would infect your computer successfully. We are like 20 years past that point. It actually further past that point. This actually happened to me. Back in the early 2000s, I received an email. <coughs> I used Symantec Antivirus Corporate Edition, which I had access to through my job um, in the past, and I opened an email in Outlook. Like, I didn't open open it, I just clicked it, and the preview loaded, and the antivirus immediately come up, came up and said it stopped a known infection. <coughs> oh boy. And yeah, you can imagine how that made me feel. I, I got a lot more security conscious a lot more quickly after that, but we are very far past those days when computers ran Windows 98 and XP and were basically the security equivalent of Swiss cheese. You could just pour water and it was guaranteed to come through. So because of that, now all the vulnerabilities that exist at this point have a tendency to be very minor vulnerabilities, even theoretical vulnerabilities that have no known, like in the wild, even research or theoretical, whatever, you know, not, not even like a proof of concept exists for these. It's just, oh, you know, we did some testing and found there was uh, this vulnerability, so we patched it. And it sounds good. In an ideal world, it sounds amazing. You have this big company that runs a huge chunk of the entire globe's operating systems, and thus, to some extent, you could argue they're responsible for keeping up with things like security. And they do these updates, and they send them out typically once a week. <clears throat> Anything they find and they patch and they fix, you know, whatever. Once a week, they'll update your system, reboot it in the middle of the night, and you're good to go. So you can feel comfortable and confident in knowing that your computer will not be affected by all of these security vulnerabilities that could have come up and could have been used to break into your machine and steal all your information, copy your documents, um, log all your passwords that you type in, whatever. That, that none of that is a concern because Microsoft is sending out automatic updates to your operating system once a week. And if it's a major emergency thing, then they might send an out-of-band update on a different day, blah, 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 blah. Now, what's the downside, Jody? What, what, why are you complaining about this? Why, why are you in a car whining about Microsoft doing this thing that is just objectively great? Just so, so, you know, it's so morally good and it, it's so benevolent and all this other stuff. Well, <clears throat> there are two reasons. One is that automatic updates 
that patch theoretical security vulnerabilities are not remotely worth what they are compared to the real threat of something going wrong during an update hosing your operating system unrecoverably and thus forcing you to wipe everything out and reinstall from scratch. That's number one. Number two is that Microsoft forces you to. You can go in and hit pause. You can say pause updates for a week, pause updates for two weeks, pause updates for a month. But after a month of paused updates, Microsoft will force you without your permission, approval, against your will, they will force you to accept an automatic update of your operating system. And this, this leads to some serious problems. See, I run a computer repair shop, so I deal with people all the time that they have some kind of update go hiccup for whatever reason and it nukes their whole computer. Because this is not something like Firefox or Chrome. If you break Firefox or Chrome, Acrobat Reader, uh, you name it, any user program break, breaks because of an automatic update. Well, what do you do? You go get the installer, you reinstall the program, it patches over everything that was not installed properly anymore, Woohoo, the whole world works. Woo! With Windows, if something goes wrong, you can end up not being able to start your computer to the point that you can fix it. Yes, I am aware that the Windows recovery environment exists. Yes, I know that if you turn your computer off by force once the spinning dots or circle is going, and then hold the power button for five seconds so it forces it off, if you do that, twice, then the third power on it will boot into Windows recovery environment. Yes, I know you can use DISM and SFC to scan system files in the recovery environment and try to patch the ones that are broken. I'm aware of all of these things. You can use check disk to run a disk check and see if there's corruption that's causing it to not boot. I cannot possibly emphasize enough that Hang on, there's a cop up here, and I don't want to crowd him. There we go. And you probably can't see him, but trust me, he's back there. What was I saying? Oh yeah, um, I've gone into the Windows recovery environment, done all the recovery things, from going in and saying, roll back last feature update, roll back last quality update, using the command prompt to use DISM, um, image, cleanup image, start component cleanup reset base, whatever it is. I've, I've used SFC scan now, and blah, blah, blah. I've used check disk. I've done all of these things on these computers that come in that won't boot and do weird stuff or just don't finish booting at all. And they do not fix the problem. Most of the time, when a computer comes in like that, it's irrevocably screwed. And I can't do anything to fix it other than nuke it. This is not good. This means the user will have to have their data backed up, which I can do. I'm, I'm totally fine with doing that. That's not a problem. But then I'll have to wipe their computer out. Every program on their computer has to be installed again. Yes, I know you can run a Windows 10 or 11. You can run another installation over the top of it and see if it'll do an in-place upgrade type deal where it preserves everything. The problem is, if something's broken, it can't do that either in, in quite a few cases. Because there's this little pesky thing in Windows called the component store. I won't go into detail about what the component store is, but the bottom line is you've got several large registry hives under system32 config. You've got Sam, the security accounts manager. Security, I don't even know what that does. I've never had to touch it. System, which is the one that's used to boot the system. It's got all the boot drivers and whatnot laid out, all the PCI identifiers and such. Software, which is huge and has all of that stuff that you probably recognize being under HK local machine software. Um, and then you've, of course, got per-user hives elsewhere. 
But the one that you probably never open and the one that I don't even recall if it's available in Registry Editor without you having to manually load it is the Components Hive. The Components Hive is important. It stores a bunch of information about how Windows is assembled under the hood. Windows is a pretty complex system at this point, and the way that it's all put together, um, it's, it's very modular under the hood, but in this bizarre way that it's not like Unix systems or Linux or whatever, you can't, it, it's not text files and defined as such. Um, it's this really complex system uh, where, bottom line is, it's cut up into a whole lot of tiny pieces and those tiny pieces of windows come together to create the complete system. If you've ever gone in to the um, programs and features, God, the, the light conditions just keep changing. If you've ever gone into the, the apps and features, the new Windows style panel, uh, control panel, and you deleted a Windows 10 style app in, that doesn't show up in the classic programs and features control panel, then you have removed a program that is installed using the same general modular system. They, they use it all over the place. If you've ever done optional features in Windows, like install the .NET 3.5 framework um, for compatibility reasons through the optional features control panel, the classic one, then you have told Windows, I want to mess with these packages that are used to assemble the operating system. Sorry, I just ate before I started this, so I do have a little bit of a hiccup thing going on. But anyway, <clears throat> the Windows is it's cut into these pieces. You can you can even go into PowerShell and a lot there are a lot of PowerShell debloat scripts or um, just general advice scripts that suggest doing things on a package level. If you've ever gone to PowerShell and used get or um, yeah get apex provisioned package to get a list of the packages and then use remove apex provision package You've manipulated the packages, the, the user visible ones anyway. But there are a bunch under the hood. There's one for each driver, you know, there's one for each type of like subsystem or individual libraries often have their own packages. The component store stores all the information about all of these. And here's the real crap thing about the component store <clears throat> the component store can get corrupted. I've seen it get corrupted many a time. If it gets corrupted, you are screwed. I have never had an incident where I have run, like in the recovery environment, where I've run some kind of, like DISM will let you tell it to clean up the image, restore health, and it will scan and repair the component store. But if the component store is already damaged, then you're screwed. And it's just, it, it's weird. If something scrambles, any in any remotely decent section of this one specific registry file your whole windows system goes kaput you you know the, the next update might fry everything and it's it's just amazing how much comes crashing down in windows if the component store gets corrupted and once it's corrupted the only real fix is to do a clean installation from scratch or to restore your system from the Windows 7 style backup medium, the one that takes a system image, Windows 10 and 11 file history don't do that, <clears throat> at least not that I'm aware. It's, it's also not exactly within, the, within the, the capability of a normal human being to do these recoveries because you have to boot Windows from a USB flash drive you have to boot an installer, you have to plug up your backup drive, you have to hope that the damn storage drivers are already part of Windows. If you have a newer PC that has special storage drivers that weren't included in Windows 10 and aren't compatible directly, then yeah, you, you can see how this can go wrong. But the bottom line is that if the component store is screwed, you're screwed. And that's it. And you're reinstalling clean. Now. We went from automatic updates to this long rambling discussion about the Windows component store. And it's like, what? I mean, get back to the update, Dodie. What does it have to do with updates, Dodie? Well, if the component store is trashed, Windows update, <laughs> it, it changes out a metric ton of components in the component store. Um, it, you're, that's actually how modern Windows updates. 
A Windows update contains a whole bunch of new component packages that replace existing component packages. And then those existing component packages are usually stored somewhere where they can be rolled back later if you want to install that update, and ultimately at some point will be deleted. And the new components are registered in place of the old components, and the files are put in place of the old files. Also, by the way, if you've ever seen that WinSXS folder in the Windows folder, <clears throat> that's Windows side-by-side, -side, that is where all of the Windows components are stored. And every file, generally speaking, in your Windows System 32, SysWow 64, uh, a bunch of different program files, every file that you see in what you would consider to be the classic normal Windows system folders or um, programs that come with Windows actually lives in WinSXS and is hard linked in the location you're used to it being. When you delete a file in System 32, you're typically not deleting a file in System 32. You're deleting one of the references to that file, and the other reference is still sitting in WinSXS. Coincidentally, if you've deleted something in System 32 and noticed that the space didn't change, that's why. Because you didn't delete the file data, the actual inode, the index, you just deleted one directory entry out of multiples pointing to the same file data area. So if Windows Update comes down and the component store has been corrupted for any reason whatsoever, you're probably going to end up with a, an unrepairably broken Windows system. No system restore will help you. You're just, you're just screwed. Chances are if the component store gets hosed and then an update happens, um, the component store was hosed long ago, and if you restore, you're restoring a bad component. You get the idea. Bottom line is, if the update didn't happen, you'd still have a corrupt component store. Eventually, you'd run into problems and probably have to reinstall anyway, but your computer would work up until the point that you decided to, rather than just breaking. And, oh, I guess, I guess that's the end of that. I want you to think about automatic updates like this. Let's say... Let's say you have a car, and you, you like to tinker with your car, and every week, this guy from the manufacturer shows up, okay? He shows up in your driveway, carrying a few parts, and he's like, hey, if you swap out your car parts for these parts, then it will improve the reliability of your car and the security of your car. You, might, you may get slightly better gas mileage, or, you know, it may perform better. Um, it may be harder to cause a failure. Oh, great, this sounds great. Yeah, just, you know, you gave me like what? Uh, let's say it's a, it's a new alternator. It, <clears throat> this alternator fixes a problem that we found that, you know, might be subject to a recall later. So, you got this new alternator, you put it on your car. Oh, okay, yeah, it works fine. Well, a week later, no, here's another alternator. At some point, something's going to go wrong. The more you do something like this, the more you tinker under the hood of your vehicle, the higher the chances are that you end up doing something wrong, or the part turns out to not be in such great condition after all. There's actually a defect in the part. Um, the, the, the new part is worse than the old part, but they didn't realize how or why. You know, something bad is going to happen. And the more you tinker under that hood, the higher the chances are something bad is going to happen. Whereas if you just leave it alone, okay, you don't have the newest and best thing all the time, but you take your chances with the existing stuff that has proven to work reliably over time. Now, it might be that there's something wrong with your existing stuff. It might be that, for example, they say, hey, there's a safety recall. There's like, um, there's a transmission mount that can just, um, that's, that is defective on some units. Um, like a, the dog bone mount that holds it um, underneath and keeps it from pivoting. Uh, it can break in half, and if it does, then it can cause engine damage. It can cause instability in your steering. It can, you know, you, you could end up in a really serious accident. So you need to install this new mount to prevent this serious problem that we know is a serious problem from occurring. Okay, it makes sense to install that manually that one time. It makes sense to update under the hood 
that one time because the risk is that this thing breaks and you end up going off the road and dying and killing your whole family. Whereas the risk on the other side is something goes wrong while putting it in or you break something that was already gonna break or you make a mistake and it's broken, <clears throat> but you know, it was gonna be bad anyway. So the downside is significantly lower for replacing it because the downside for not replacing it is just so serious. It makes sense to do um, as needed spot updates for critical problems. However, Microsoft doesn't even do that. Microsoft has, has updates that are required or mandatory or, you know, I don't remember the verbiage they use, but they have updates that they're going to install whether you like it or not, and then they have optional, or in the past they called them recommended updates that you don't have to install. But there's no indication that, well, this is a critical, like, like on a scale from like one to nine, this is a nine. If you don't patch this, you're almost guaranteed to get infected. There's no indication if, if the severity of what they're gonna force on you is a nine, or if it's more of a four or a five. It's severe because it's not trivial and, and really, really, you know, uh, affects almost no one. And it, it's different if you're a person versus a company. So don't do automatic updates if you can help it. I strongly recommend if you're running Windows anything, and Windows whatever home, that you do an up, upgrade to Pro and don't pay for it. Go to massgrave.dev, M-A-S-S-G-R-A-V-E dot D-E-V, and you can download the, um, what do they call them, Microsoft Activation Scripts. Download that, get the all-in-one edition. It's a CMD file, you run it as administrator, and you can activate everything. You can download Office, whatever. But you can get MAS, and you can tell it to upgrade you from Home to Pro, and then you can tell it to use HWID to send a ticket to Microsoft, and Microsoft's activation servers will give you a free Windows Pro license. They could turn this off anytime they wanted to, and they have chosen not to. You can still get a free Windows license from Microsoft even today for Windows 10 or 11 Pro. No biggie. <sighs> so, with that said, you can use gpedit.msc, you can use group policy, go into the Windows Update Policies and find um, Configure Automatic Updates, set that policy to Disabled, and it will never force updates on you again. You get to choose whether they get installed or not, although you can't choose which ones. Uh, I just choose not to update at all. Then you can also, while you're in there, enable one called No Automatic Restart when uh, users are logged in. Um, it's not worded exactly that way, but it prevents it, if it does happen to update, it prevents it from auto-rebooting on you. So at least if updates are installed, you have infinite time to make the decision to reboot. But, <clears throat> now that you've made it this far, I'm gonna make it worth your while. All of that's me complaining about automatic updates and how automatic updates decrease the reliability of your equipment in general. Let's get into some specifics because it's worse than that. If, if you've gotten this far and if you've watched all my shit, you know it's way worse than just, oh, Windows might break if something goes wrong during an update. It's not that simple. <clears throat> automatic updates of anything are bad for that reason, but I want you to think a little more sinister. Let's talk about my security cameras. Envision this. You have, how many do I have? Five security cameras. Five internet security cameras. They communicate with a cloud server, but all the storage is local on SD cards. But they use a cloud server for the app functionality, whatever. A long, long time ago, for this particular model of camera I have, they removed the ability to send the camera footage to a network video recorder, basically a DVR, 
<clears throat> over your LAN, and now you can only store it on the SD card. You can only access the footage by going in to the SD card, removing it from the camera, plugging it into a computer, and pulling it that way, or using the smartphone app. Nobody makes PC programs for this anymore because Internet Explorer and ActiveX was the way that they all worked, and Internet Explorer's phased out a long time ago now. So they just kind of go, yeah, I don't know. We don't, we don't, we, now that we can't use ActiveX, we can't do anything. And everybody's behind NAT, so NAT traversal's a thing. You, you get the idea. It's not easy, and I'm not going to pretend that it's easy to set up a system where if your phone is behind carrier-grade NAT and your IP camera is behind a NAT router, this is a common occurrence, by the way. This is basically guaranteed to be the way that your stuff is set up. If you're on Starlink, then you're behind NAT, too. You're behind CG NAT there. It's still NAT. Both ends have NAT. <coughs> NAT traversal is a persistent problem. And yeah, IPv6 exists, but you pretty much have to ignore it for the purposes of this discussion. It's still a niche thing in terms of what it can do for you, because a lot of times you don't get an IPv6 address. So, it's not easy traversing NATs, especially when there's a NAT on both sides, both ends needing to pierce it, it can be difficult. It can sometimes be impossible, which is why <coughs> all of these companies that provide these cloud-based services have a relay system where both, the, both of the systems can talk to this central relay whatever that has a public IP, and all it really does is bounce the traffic from one to the other through this third party. Instead of the third party just setting up the connection, now the third party is bouncing all of the traffic for the connection. They're doing all the work, not just some of the work. All right? I understand that this is not easy. At the same time, I resent the fact that I have no way other than some smartphone app that goes through this cloud provider whatever servers. And I'm going to tell you right now, the one I was using, it, they, I never paid for any cloud anything. It was not marketed as a cloud camera. It has local storage. It works fine. The only reason I even need the app is A, to be able to see the footage remotely so I can see what's going on at my office or my house or whatever, even when I'm not there. Make sure that there's nobody breaking in. And B, to configure the cameras. You need the app to configure the cameras. Now, I, I could even deal with only being able to, the, to configure them over a LAN. And, you know, I could even deal with them only being accessible locally. But the thing is, now there's just no way. You, they took away the ability for anything to reach into the camera and pull footage unless it's their servers, their, their smart camera application thing. That's it. <clears throat> and here's where it gets bad. What happens when you have an older camera system and the manufacturer decides that it's time for them to just stop dealing with it? Or, more sinister, the manufacturer decides that it's time for you to give them more fucking money. Probably what happened to me. I updated my camera app recently. And when I went back in, every camera, instantaneously now, I've got this new version Every camera suddenly changed from a thumbnail preview of the last thing you saw on the camera to the this model is retired and no longer supported. You couldn't click through it, you couldn't configure it, you couldn't pull video, you couldn't do anything. It just said, eh, this model no, too old, not supported anymore, we've retired support for it. Now keep in mind, at no point was I ever notified that this would happen. The company unilaterally made this decision. They decided that it was that it was going to just they were just going to stop supporting this camera and they were going to cut off all my security without asking me, without notifying me, nothing. I had no opportunities whatsoever to do anything otherwise. So, I've got these cameras, they don't work anymore. <clears throat> because an app update. But here's the fun part, okay? This is the new app. 
I still had the old app because they, at one point, made a new one. I didn't know about it. I've been using the old one for years. When I got the new one at one point, it seemed to work a little bit better. It was a little bit faster. So, of course, I switched over to that, but I kept the old one because I don't trust anybody. Well, my trust, uh, my lack of trust turned out to be my saving grace. As I can pull up my cameras right now, even today, despite them saying that the cameras are no longer compatible with their systems and their servers, and they're retiring all support for them, that, hey, guess what? If you have the old app, or even if you have the version before the new one they just put out, it works. I haven't tested that, but it was working until I updated. And, and the old one, I can pull it up right now. I can pull my cameras up right now. I just pulled cameras up today. This happened like a week or two ago. Camera still works, just not with the new app that artificially tells me it doesn't work. Now, I understand why a provider that's giving me this, this free relay service or whatever for the cameras, I understand why they would want to phase them out. <clears throat> Here's where I take offense. First of all, they force me with these cameras, they force me to use these cameras with their cloud system. I cannot administer them locally. I can't like, they run Linux. I can't get a root shell on them. They patch that vulnerability, but th there's no secure shell into the cameras. There's no like telnet style connection to the cameras. There's, there's nothing. There is no way that I can talk to these cameras at all and do anything of value with them. The cameras talk to their servers only, and their servers talk to whatever app thing on your device happens to work with them, and that's it. I'm not given the option. And when they decided they were gonna retire it, they didn't say that to me in any way. I just ran the update. I foolishly didn't read the notes. The notes did at least say retiring these models, and my model was in there. Of course, the chances of me remembering my camera model number, um, you know, if I'm a normie, much less reading the release notes, not very high. <coughs> and um, I have no, I, they didn't release any kind of new firmware. Like, if you're going to retire the camera, the least you could do is put out firmware that unlocks access to secure shell at, at a minimum at a minimum secure shell let me access my camera do what I want with my camera rather than you locking the camera down to only talk to your cloud system which of course means when the internet goes out then there's no way to even retrieve footage from the camera short of walking over to it and yanking the card but they didn't give me back control of the camera when they unilaterally decided I was no longer going to have access to my own hardware. And that is the culmination of everything I'm trying to tell you with this video. Automatic updates and more generally just control of your device by some other entity means you don't own it. It means that even if you own it, even if you paid for it, even if you paid thousands of dollars for it, you don't actually own it. And no, this is not about the whole you you agreed to a license. You didn't you didn't you didn't buy the software, you bought a license. It's not that kind of thing either. Ownership requires that you're able to do what you want with something. If I give you a car, but I don't give you the keys to the car, then ignoring the fact that you can maybe go and get keys made for it, I've given you a brick. I've given you a, you know, two-ton metal box on wheels that you can't even get into, that you can't start, that you can't drive, you can't do anything with. If I sell you a car, if I sell you a car, but I take the radio out, uh, take the heated seats out, take the air conditioner out, if I take all these parts out of the car, then you can't use those parts because they're not in the car. But if I sell you a car, like Tesla does, if I sell you a car, and there are things that I sell in the car, 
that I don't turn on unless you pay me extra money. They're already there. You've effectively already paid for them to be physically installed. You own the hardware. But it's controlled by a software lock, an artificial fake-ass software lock. Well, then you don't own, in the philosophical sense, that hardware at all because you don't control it. Ownership is control. I believe that they say that possession is nine-tenths of the law, something to that effect. <clears throat> I mean, I don't own... If I rent, if I like rent an apartment, I don't own the apartment, but I effectively own it for legal purposes. And as long as I'm paying the rent, I own it because I control it. That's one of the fun things, by the way. And in, in, at least in America, if you pay to lease a home or apartment or whatever, uh, lease a, a domicile, a residence, then you have the right to quiet enjoyment and the landlord, whoever it is that actually owns or manages the property, whoever you're paying, who technically is the owner, according to the government, of that property, they're not allowed to just show up on your property. It's yours when you start paying to lease it from them. They can't do what they want with it because they've signed those rights away and given them to you as long as you pay to continue keeping those rights. So yeah, ownership is a funny thing. There's the, there's the concept of legal ownership and then there's the philosophical concept of ownership. As long as I'm paying the rent for my apartment, I own that apartment. But here's the problem. It doesn't quite work that way, does it? You don't actually own the apartment. The apartment people can still unilaterally decide we're going to remodel the apartments. You're gonna have to, or we're gonna repave the parking lot to your apartments and you're gonna have to do things and that's just all there is to it. You, you know, you'll have to park somewhere else while we repave the parking lot and you'll get over it. You know, no one cares. You'll get over it. Let's see. Everybody's slowing down. Same thing with cars. You've got heated seats in your BMW, but you have to pay BMW a rental fee every month for the heated seats in your car. But the difference is the heated seat in your car, it's your car. And you technically own the heated seat too. But they're charging you rent. Basically, it's like a protection racket. To use something you already own, they're charging you a rental fee. Same thing when Toyota did the thing where they were like, oh, you can have remote start, but you're going to have to pay a rental fee. Now, understand that that required cell phone network usage. So it was a little more understandable because you do have to pay for the cell phone connection. <clears throat> but what's wrong with traditional remote start? I don't need cellular remote start. I want to be able to hit a button on my remote and have it talk to the car directly. I don't want cellular remote start. Who, what kind of moron wants that? Sounds like a great way to get your car broken into or stolen by somebody who hacks it. God, what a stupid idea. So it is with hardware and software. Hardware cannot meaningfully be used without software that is required to run that hardware. Likewise, if you do not control that software, you do not control that hardware. Even if you own your copy of the software, it's useless to you if that copy of the software is still set up to where it won't let you talk to it. If you're completely shut out of it and you can't just replace it, what are you going to do? So yes, I consider the fact that this company decided to retire my camera with no notice or warning um, artificially and didn't send out a firmware update to unlock the camera so I could do whatever I wanted with it, at least. I consider that to be them stealing my camera from me. They had no right to cut off my access to the camera and then rig it up to where if their system doesn't you know, work with the camera, then nothing can work with the camera. No one can use the camera. If we can't have it, nobody can have it. They had no right to do that. I own the camera. So what are my options? Well, if I, if I want access to my camera now, what do I have to do? Well, I have to uh, connect up. I have to rip it open, possibly destroying it in the process. Um, I have to find a way to dump the flash, if possible, if it's even possible, I have to disassemble the flash once I've figured all that out. Um, I, have to, I have to figure out how I can dump it and decompile it 
reverse engineer it. Um, you know, what are what what kind of processors are embedded in this thing? And you know, what architecture, what mode, how does the bootloader work? I have to reverse engineer the entire device. All of the software from the from the ground up. Figure out how it boots and all that. I'd have to figure everything out from scratch. And chances are very good that this camera is running some kind of really stripped down, proprietary-ish Linux thing that they came up with. It's probably not running a standard bootloader because there are a lot of these weirdo embedded camera systems that don't. Um, they, I mean, they don't, you know, there are a lot of these companies that don't want you to do this. That automatic updates are bad. Um, ownership of your system re relies on control of the software for that system. And if you don't control the software, then you don't technically own the system. And wrestling away the control of your system like that means that it makes your system less reliable. It makes it more likely to break. And, I mean, you're just... <laughs> You have no control over your own hardware. What if one day Microsoft decides they're gonna send a poison pill update down and everybody with automatic updates enabled is gonna have their computer torpedoed and now you just have to go buy a new machine or better yet, one of Microsoft's rent a thin client and use a bigger PC over the internet. This is a real thing that they wanna do. I think I just found me a parking spot. Yeah, Microsoft really, really wants to do that. This, this is a serious idea. Windows is a service. And what's to stop them from basically nuking every Windows 10 and 11 machine that isn't new enough or that they just decide they don't want to deal with anymore? What's to stop them from intentionally sabotaging your computer, taking your own computer away from you, forcing you to reinstall or whatever, um, in order to pad their own pockets. Nothing. There's nothing that stops them short of the threat of a billion lawsuits. Um, and even then, it's Microsoft. What are you going to do? You don't have a big team of lawyers. What are you going to do about it, buddy? You, you little ant. They'll squish you. It's a sad state of affairs, but yeah, it just software updates are bad. And more generally, big companies controlling what you can do with the hardware you own often using control over the software on the hardware, keeping it in their control instead of yours, um, it's just evil. And you should do what you can to not support companies that are like this. Anyway, you know the the drill. Like, comment, subscribe, and all that. And if you, if you got this far, maybe throw me some cash. I don't know. PayPal's the best way to do it. I turned off super thanks and all that because YouTube doesn't deserve to get 30% of the money that you send through supers, uh, I'd rather you send it to PayPal who takes more like 4%. Um, that way more of the money that you're burning goes to me instead of you giving it to YouTube. Anyway, um, I'm going to find my way out of this circle and I'll talk to you next time. Take care.